All right, let's see how we go with tonight's stream. We're going for low latency tonight. It's not ultra low, it's just low. The penalty you get for going with the lower latency is that the quality of the stream suffers. So uh, things may seem grainier or I'm, I'm just not sure how it will end up on the YouTube side of things. But uh, uh, I'm actually just going to try and see if I can follow the stream on the MacBook, uh, not the MacBook, the iMac because the screen for the iMac is actually pretty good so I should be able to get an idea of the rendering qualities and stuff like that once I get rid of the adverts alright so I'm watching myself it's a bit of uh, auto voyeurism I suppose <coughs> ok a 10 minute tech, Miles, Maddie, Kenny, DeAndre Andrew, hey Market Rescue Alright, so this is the nice juicy plank that we're going to use. And I see the video is a bit grainy. Yeah, this is going to drive me up the wall. Oh well, it is what it is. People ask for this, this is what they're going to get. And my goodies arrived. Now, these are just ones I had lying around. Basically, it's nothing fancy. I can't remember, is this a 1200? I think this is a 1200 socket board. Yeah, LGA 1200. And we're just going to make a open platform machine. And we're just going to mount it on this plank of wood. I should have cut the wood before I got started, but what I'll do is I'll size it up and then I'll run the circular saw with everything attached. Hey, IoT dude. Osis, Steve, Santa Claus, yeah, Santa was a bit slack getting here, I had to buy this myself. Uh, and look, it's a non-exploding power supply. I mean, to be fair, they're all sort of possibly dubious, but who knows. Silverstone, I don't know, but um, there was a company in Australia called Silverstone. And they produced model aircraft gear, radio electronics and stuff. So I don't know, and their logo looks very similar, so I'm not sure what the deal is there. I can't imagine it was them. Uh. Whoop, what was that? Yeah. The bank telling me they're going to take money out of my account. The micro repairs. Yeah, well, it seems like I, I can't find the certificate, the uh, certificate of explosion in this power supply sort of box. So I guess it's not going to be one of those. Obviously, it's not one of those loom systems where you can plug in what you need, but you know, it's ample, I think, for the task. Now, if I remember correctly, this should come with two PCIe. No, that's CPU. Oh, there we go. Okay, so they're basically, they're kind of cheating. They've got to be on the same outlet from the power supply, but that's okay. It's not a big issue in my book. Uh, Miles, no, but to be fair, the Gigabyte one was probably, it was like an Easter egg, and you just had to turn on the power supply to activate the Easter egg. Alright, so, let's see, what's this board? I got this board because it had basically pretty much one of everything. Yeah, it's got the PS2, it's got the USB 2, it's got the USB 3 or USB-C, it's got USB 3. It's got DisplayPort, HDMI, DVI. Yeah, it's basically got everything I need if I'm going to be doing testing and stuff like that. I just realised I don't have my glasses. Where's the bag of goody good screws that I need? 
Well, we're not going to need the back plate at least. Wait, seriously? What the f Have I been gypped here? Oh, wait, yeah, okay, main boards don't normally come with screw kits, it's the cases that come with the screw kits. Oh well. It did come with that one screw though. And we need that to hold in the um, SSD. Actually, I'm not even sure if this one's going to work. Because I didn't bother to check to see whether this board will take SATA. Or is it if, if it's just NVMe? Didn't read the destructions. If it takes NVMe, that's fine. Yeah, I really don't know. We'll plug it in, and if it boots, then we know it works. If it doesn't, then we know it doesn't. Very technical way of determining. But it's actually got three video outs, Miles. A DVI, HDMI, DisplayPort. Technically four if you um, use the USB-C. Although I don't know if the CPU would support it. Install processor before removing cover. Yeah, okay. <coughs> we learnt this trick the last time. Okay, I'm just going to fix up those pins so that it's a new egg style. Okay, where's the keying marks? So install processor before removing the cover. Okay, what the fuck? I don't like that noise one bit. Oh, I see it. It was that. So what's the technical reason for them doing that? Is there... Were people just being stupid? So why do they make you do it that way? Not that they make you make you. They just sort of recommend it. You're supposed to be studying. Okay, Jessica, I'll try not to tell too many people. Protect the pins during shipping. Well, I mean, I get that. But then, why is it a problem if I popped it off before I put the CPU in? I guess that's my question. People are stupid. Okay, I'm going to go with Jim Allen's one. Uh, this is a G6400 Pentium. So, it's basically a very what you might consider a nondescript processor but they do the job and that's all that I care about and I'm going to stick the processor in about there unfortunately they didn't give me the option to use leaded solder for the uh, paste <laughs> clink not the greatest fan of this system it does work but it's caught me out a few times in the past with customer machines you find you know one leg didn't quite lock in but that's looking good it's possible this ram is no good we'll find out we're going to use it to test Is it not even the right... Did you pick up the wrong RAM, Paul? Wait, what the hell is this DDR? DDR4? Is this DDR3? Right, we're going to need a hammer. And a bit of angle grinding. Because we need to fix up that DDR4 issue. I'm just going to get the angle grinder.
I don't know how I ended up picking up that. These are my DDR4s. So I've got 8 gigs versus... You've got to be at 4 gigs, surely. I hate it when they don't make it clear on the sticker what gigabytes they are. And for the first time ever, I just noticed that these RAM sticks actually have a uh, profile to them. I didn't realize. I always thought they were just straight. But they're not. They cut back about three quarters of a millimeter out here. Ah, the things you notice. Yesterday it's discovering that my UV torch has bronze color. <laughs> Today it's DDR4 sticks have a cutaway recess. Paste? We don't need no paste. Come on, man. This is a little Pentium. It's not going to need paste. There already is built in on these heat sinks. You'll see three little bands of uh, grey goo, and that's what that is. Da, 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 da. So what I'll end up doing is mounting the power supply and everything like that on the board directly. And I'll bond it down or screw it down. I might have to get some little right angle brackets so that I can screw it here. Or I can just use hot glue. That's always a favourable option. Yeah, I'm testing graphics cards, but that's just in terms of BIOS testing and things like that. I'm not actually doing much else. And besides, the graphics card is the one that's going to get hot, not the not the CPU. The CPU is going to be doing very little. Oh, really, Miles? That's funny. Funny that we both ran into the same issue. I think I've got some sodiums still running around somewhere. And little sims even. Sims where you had like one megabyte sims. Not one gigbyte, but one megabyte. There were even 256k ones. Da, 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 da. There's not really much else to do on these things. I mean, that's basically it. Um, yeah, it really is. Unless this doesn't go... So all I have to do is plug the power in and plug a screen in and I'm booting. Keyboard mouse, where's my screen? Maybe I can bolt the screen on here, but I'm not going to do that. It'll become an all-in-one steampunk. All -in Actually, it wouldn't really be steampunk because I don't have like the crazy copper, bronze, leather combination. Okay, I'm just going to turn that off just in case it does decide to go kabango. What else am I going to need? I'll need a keyboard and mouse. Yeah, we used to always have a board like this in the workshop for each tech. So each tech would have their own test board. And with that, they could then, you know, whenever customers would bring in equipment that wasn't working, you could use this setup as a uh, diagnostic differentiator. So you can work out whether it's one part or the other. Let's see. HDMI cable next. Yeah, let's see. We use the dodgy one that came with the microscope camera. It's dodgy at 4K, but it's pretty good at HD, so we're going to let it live out its life as a HD cable. And we need 12 volts for the screen. 
Hey Travis, welcome. Need a power button as well. Ah, there's always something, isn't there? Thanks for reminding me. Screwdriver will do the trick for the moment. This will come up. Could have 3D printed a fancy test bench. <laughs> I'll tell you, 3D printing something that would handle this. That would be a little bit over the top. Okay, power LED, power switch. Interesting, there's two power LEDs. Oh well. Alright then, let's get to it. No shorting of pins. What? You mean like this? It didn't work, you know why? <sighs> Someone doesn't uh, have any juice plugged in. Try to find a place I can insert some juice in. Uh, not really my preferred location, but I am going up to my main power panel here. I'm trusting that the silver tone will not explode on me. Trusting. And is it switched on? No, it's not. There we go. I have a feeling this is not going to work with that SSD. So fan rate's picking up. There we go, we're booting. And now we're not. It's probably just going through a initialization phase. Hey Jason. <laughs> hey Greg. Yep, it's just going through an initialization phase, I think. Wow, it really does take its time trying to work out what it's doing. A CD. There we go. That is probably the longest initial boot I've ever encountered. It might be because it's not happy with that. I'll just go find my Ubuntu boot stick. I'd say it's because it's not happy about having that in it. Oh no, it did get it. There we go. That definitely has to be the longest setup boot sequence I've ever encountered with a new motherboard. I didn't do anything yet, I've just plugged it in, turned it on, and let it go. But yeah, there is this second slot here. Oh, who's messaging me now? Hey Richard, so what's it doing? It's Looks like it's checking the drive. It's probably checking the drive because I kind of shut it down unceremoniously the other time. No, I'm not going to bother with um, any of that stuff. I'm not expecting anything, no, but I mean, the actual, the process I'm complaining about is, well, wasn't even complaining about, just more remarking on, was how long it took 
to go from a factory fresh board to the point where it had worked out what it's dealing with. Okay, so what have we got? You're in emergency mode. After logging in, blah blah blah. Yeah, I'm not surprised it's in emergency mode. Okay. It's going to be better off for me to put a stick into here and actually just reflash the whole thing. Because that is running the BIOS for... Oh, not the BIOS. That setup is for my other machine, which is a 8th gen whatever, whatever. That's fine. So we're just going to power down, plug this in, and reinstall from this. Believe me, this is not going to be a performance type system. I'm not even trying to be a performance system. It's just a tester system. So whether it's there or in the CPU slot or that or that, it's really very, very irrelevant. And I know it drives people insane, but it is irrelevant for this scenario. Okay. So all I want to do here is change my boot option. Oh, here we go. So shift up. Go. Okay. Oh, the bias isn't too bad. Yeah, it's a test bench rig. That's all it is. And that's the other thing is, you know, this thing is going to change over and over and over. Like it'll be, have different RAM and it'll have different drive in it. Um, let's see. Ubuntu. That's the whole point of it. You're basically just using it as a bootable platform and then whatever you got to do with it, you got to do with it. Um, this is... I'm just going to put, I'm basically just going to mount it onto this wood and it's going to look just fine as it is and it's going to be open. I don't need any 3D print on this one. Really, because all it needs to be is it's just going to be a flat platform and I'll hang it over the edge so that the cards will fit and that's it. Holy crap, that was loud. That came out of the screen. Well, we at least know audio works. Crikey, that was loud. <laughs> Continue. Yeah, easy access to the components, easy access to, you know, swapping them in and out. It's a machine that you'll probably use once every month or so, maybe. And that would be about it. Okay, I don't have a Wi-Fi module plugged into this, so we won't bother downloading anything. Let's see. Erase disk and install. Continue. No, oh, it actually got the town right. Ah, my name, PLD... Machine test box, even though it's not a box. Four ones. Log in automatically. Continue. I will actually be keeping the power supply on top. Because there may be a case where I need to test another power supply. Although these days I do have, you know, those um, automatic power supply testers. But I'll be leaving the power supply on top. Uh, it's still only going to take up this much space. It's perfectly fine. Uh, Miles, what do you mean by... I won't be changing the CPU, I can tell you that much. So... Come on, surely you guys have all seen just open slab machine setups for testing. 
Jason, it's basically for testing things out. Maybe you know you want to test a RAM stick, or you want to test a drive, or you want to test a card. Yeah, things like that. Or in this case, I want to be able to test a GPU, uh, you know, the 1080 graphics card that I've got. Data recovery, I already have a server set aside for that. I have little uh, mini ITX machines for data recovery with a, pardon me, a loading drive bay. And the, and the um the drive bay that I have for putting in the drive that you want to recover, it has a power switch on the inside which you can control through software. So that lets you be able to power off the device, power on the device at whim, which sometimes you need to do when you're doing data recovery. Obviously, in an ideal world, the person would just send it off to you know a um, data recovery service and they'll pay a couple of thousand dollars for it but there are many times where you can still do a software based data recovery through th tools like DD Rescue and when you couple it with the switching relay for the power to the device you can usually do a pretty good job yes all my data recovery is done in Linux You're going to put standoffs. Yes, I am, Noosa. Yep. Uh, we're getting there. We're getting there. One thing I've got to decide is whether I'll use flat based standoffs or whether <coughs> I will try and drill holes into this board, sink the offsets into it, the standoffs, and then you know, glue them in. So, hey, Steve B, how's it going? Usually you get nylon standoffs. Uh, I'll see if I've, I've got them around somewhere. Probably don't have enough. Hey, girl, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're chasing moths like a crazy lunatic. Did you get it? Did you get it? Crazy, crazy cat. <sighs> well, I was just glad the power supply didn't blow up. And I was actually glad that it worked with that uh, drive because the 12th gen board that I got, for the one that's doing this stream right now, that does not support the SATA versions. Okay, these are... It's basically like these, but with a flat bottom rather than the um, keyed bottom like that. And yeah, I don't seem to have any on hand. That's okay. I'll get a few. Get them in my next Element 14 order. Oh, that I could use copious quantities of hot glue, but you know I'm not going to do that. Dow could work too, yes. The CPU combo. This is just a, yeah, a little bit. It's just a Pentium, a low-grade Pentium. It's an LGA 1200 board. So whatever the Pentium is that comes with that. I just got the cheapest CPU I could. They didn't seem to have any Celerons. I honestly would have been fine putting a Celeron in it. That's no drama to me. Come on, you almost finished. Hurry up. The only thing that I had hoped I could have gotten, but I didn't with this board, is to actually have... A, I mean, I've got the 16, I've got the 1, but I was hoping I would get a 4 um, by 4 PCIe slot. But I couldn't really find anything that had that and all the other things that I wanted. So I took the compromise and... Yeah. 
Let's see. Installation is complete. You need to restart. The LG A1200 i3s were pretty expensive for me. So I, since, like I said, this isn't going to be a performance machine, I went with the Pentium. <laughs> At least Celerons are better these days to, compared to what they used to be like. I mean, the original Celerons were, okay, they were genuinely terrible. Celery computers. Yep, there we go. All good. Uh, no, do not send data to Ubuntu. Next. I'll see if it. I'll see if I can find my Wi-Fi chipset. Usually, I use a little TP-Link one. Cheapest chips, but very good. These are the Wi-Fi USB dongles I like. The TP-Link, it's a, it is only a, uh, what is it? It's not a very high spec one, but it's more than ample for what I'm doing, except when I can't squeeze it in. Fine, we'll let you hog a USB 3 port even though I don't want you to. select network there we go it's already up and running uh, keyboard one two three four five six seven two yeah I think it's one of the 150 ones I used to buy them in the dozen because I'd always give them away to people because at the time like about you know, five to ten years ago a lot of the boards didn't have uh, Wi-Fi by default, so these were a very nice, quick, simple, easy method of getting Wi-Fi to people. Okay, can we have a terminal? Seems good. Okay. Let's see here we go. Pseudo apt update. I'm probably going to kill the stream with the activity I'm going to chew up on the process. Uh, the on the MBN line. Pseudo apt upgrade. And what have we got? 500 megabytes to download. Alright. This should very conveniently wreck the upload speed. What are we getting? Yeah. We're only getting three and a half megabit per second down at the moment. I'm going to blame the Australian archive for that. So that's got two minutes to go, basically. Uh, Twiki, basically, I'll. It is going to be a portable computer, as it were. So you know, it's. Come here, power supply. Keep up. Keep up. So it's effectively going to be mounted like that. 
and then the power supply, yeah, I might stick it back here or I might stick it over here. Putting it over here means I can cut the board short to about this sort of distance and so that might work out nicely. There is actually sufficient room there too. The monitor, they will always be mobile so we're not going to you know, uh, mount that on there. Use the main repository. The main repository does seem to be a bit slower for me here in Australia. Sadly we're still at two minutes to go. And it's down to only two megabit per second. That sucks. It must be all the flooding in Australia. I'm going to blame that. Uh, unfortunately this wasn't too expensive. I think it was... Um, I think it was only about 210... 210 220 dollars for the main board cpu and the power supply that's australian dollars so i'm quite happy with that i should be running at 10 megabit per second or you know 100 okay we're up to almost four megabit now and now we're down to 600 k bit <laughs> we're ruined Yeah, the forever two minute syndrome, except now it's five minutes. Wow, they, they're they really suffering down there. There is a lot of flooding going on down there, and I know there's got to be at least a couple of these universities using lines that are passing through the flooded areas. Got an old PC. I actually don't want to. I don't want it in a PC case. Explicitly don't want it, because it inhibits your ability to quickly just swap things in and out. Particularly if you've got to do probing on boards or anything like that, then you want to be able to get direct side access. Now this is intentionally going to be a slab of wood computer. And it's something I can then just sort of slide under the bench, take it out when I need it. Uh, the advantage of living in the city is one gigabit dual fiber. That would be very nice to have. On a good night, I will get the full um, 10 megabyte transfer rate a second. But this does not look like it's one of those nights. And it doesn't help that I'm chewing up quite a lot with the upload. Hey, Micromage. And I gotta say though, you know, this wood, this is some sexy wood. I'll be able to write things on it too. It's nice having a slab of good looking wood in the workshop and something that's, it's even got the nice smell of the wood. It's, it's not too dominated by the bonding glue that they would have used. They've done an exceptionally good job with this particular plank. Yeah, you can see the seam lines just simply because the grain changes, but it's a very nice piece. On a slab of VB, yeah. They get drunk board syndrome. Ah, oh, MDF. Yeah, MDF is very convenient in many ways, but I do hate the way that it powders up, and I hate that it is so heavy, which it's a good thing. Another, It's very heavy, but you don't get the structural strength relative to natural wood with that weight, and I also hate the fact that it blunts the living daylights out of your tools, like your drill bits, your chisels, everything like that. They always go blunter a bit quicker with the MDF and of course yeah, the, um, the dust that comes out of when you're working on it it itches as well yeah MDF is pressed wood but there's also a yeah, glue component in there too Uh, 
MDF stands for medium, medium density fiberboard. You can also get stuff known as LDF, which is light density or low density fiberboard. And they often use that for um, uh, notice boards. So you can put you know, pins into it. It's that, uh, it's that low in its density. I like camphor laurel. Camphor is, um, I find it a bit powerful for me. I know you know, a lot of people love it. But I'm probably biased simply from the fact that you know, most of us have parents who had a camphor box to hold all the blankets in. The stuff that is actually more just pressed wood is the uh, masonite board. That It's that dark board that has a very shiny side on one side and then a rough side on the other. That tends to be probably a little bit better than MDF but you don't get it in very thick pieces though stops the bugs yeah that's right with the camphor silky oak is a very nice one as well the way you know if you get that if you get the right cut against the grain and it comes up those iridescent rings uh, pallets also made from um, not usually pallets are typically made from just rough pine they may have, depending on what they're carrying, they may have some hardwood elements in it. But they will use MDF as a sheet over the top sometimes. But the actual main beams and slats are typically just coarse pine, coarse plantation pine. Need some black high density polyethylene or a slab of white delrin. Yeah, I think I'll pass on that. Dolan is nice. I do like how it machines. It's slippery though. I would suggest to put the power on the upper side. What do you mean up there? Yeah, it's probably not a bad suggestion given that we have this and this up there. Come on. Well, I don't even know what I'm waiting for because really, you know, it's done. Made my bed sides with camphor drawer bases. The main body is silky oak. Draw fronts of red cedar and silky oak press joined together. That's a bit of comprehensive work you've done there, Jason. You're going to tell me that you put dovetail joins all through it? Steve K, you like masonite. <laughs> well, it, it's actually very handy stuff, to be honest. It sort of gets overlooked a lot, but it is good stuff. Okay, shut down. Eleven months to make that. That's dedication, Jason. That really is dedication. Because I know well, my father, being a carpenter, um, um, you know, I saw all the work that went into doing you know, things like furniture, cabinets, things like that. He wasn't a cabinet maker himself. He was more of a um, construction carpenter. But he did periodically do cabinet work usually for us in the house so yeah I remember all the work he would put into it and then of course I did it at school as well and obviously I still did it at home uh, well no drums this this is all working so I'm just going to shut it down and we can get on with the board repair power off power off I kind of ran out of time tonight. Like I said, I was hoping to already have this cut to size and have found some standoffs. But I figured out, oh, well, we'll just get this at least put together and then we can come back another day and I can show you the finished product. Kind of like a cooking show.
Because we've got a lot of board repairs to do. Okay, so what we sounds like what we're going to go for is basically this configuration. I think I'll, let's see, can I put it flat? I don't know if I qu quite got enough. Can I do it flat? I can do it flat and it just fits. I suppose that's viable. Yeah, that's probably viable. Let me cut it off there. It'll be fine. And I'll put the on off button switches or something up here. I do have some panels that I can use for the on off button switches with proper mechanical switch keys. Two shots before and up. Yeah. <laughs> Jason just sent me some pics. Oh, cool. This is going to be of the awesome joinery. Open. Oh, yeah, that's some that's some proper work. Yep. Jason knows how to do good join work. And especially when you're fighting with the natural properties of wood sometimes. Like if you, you know, you've got a shake in the wood or something like that. So... Yeah, that's some good good joins there. You can see the silky oak. Certainly much better than anything I ever done. Hey Mark Sims. Power supply fans blocked oh yeah, right, sorry. I'm sure I would have worked that out. There we go. That should stop the triggering. Oh, happy now? I have an old neighbour who taught you, who was a master craftsman, and s see the front bonding. I did see a bit of that. I didn't want to show everybody everything. Oh, you mean the waving? The wave stuff? The way that you've... sort of used two pieces of wood to... get that wave effect? That's pretty cool. Some tight tolerances there. Put the power supply on the side of the fan intake face and the CPU and the power leads down. You mean like this sort of thing? I mean it's sort of more stable for some reason because yeah, I think I'll be fine there like this. I mean, agreeably, that there will give you more clearance. Mm. Choices, choices, man. It's going to be like deciding between two shades of blue when it comes to paint in the house. Yeah, alright. Let's put this thing away. Before we start more wars than what we already have in this damn world. Just hot glue down. Um, Artan, I was seriously considering that. <laughs> For the power supply, at least, I was considering the hot glue option. Because, uh, yeah, you just give it a, a swift sort of hit and it will break free off those. Ah, uh, uh, jeez. Paul's workshop has become too small. Oh, shite. Yeah, the workshop's too small. Okay, you're going to... Right, precariously balanced in places it shouldn't be. Glue some magnets to the wood. But that will affect the signals and data and will probably... Oh, I threw that CPU cover away. Maybe I shouldn't have. Does it really matter? I mean, it's not like I'm going to change CPUs on that board. I used to have a... Um, entire board and CPU and unfortunately a customer's what was it I think it was their it was their GPU they had like a little 710 GPU and for whatever reason I couldn't get it to work in their machine something was wrong I was trying to diagnose it and I plugged it into mine and it wrecked everything destroyed the power supply, wrecked the main board, killed the CPU, 
and um, destroyed the hard drive. I it put 12 volts on 3v3 or 5 volt rail, I can't remember now. But even though the TVS, oh that's right, the hard drive actually did manage to save because the TVS diode did actually do its job on the hard drive. So it did save that. But the main board and everything else was wrecked. Okay, oh, that's a RMA board. 3437 complete with bugs. Hello, Click Beetle. What are you up to tonight? Hey, B Blood. Weren't you here? This was here last night. He obviously likes to hang around. What are you doing, dude? Come on. I'm sure most of you are um, aware of Click Beetles. They're funny little things. Come on. You gonna click? He's not in the mood. Is in no mood to be a showpiece. All right, fine. You can get out of here then. Ah, uh, Jason, which one did you get? Did you get the proper full size one, like what Lewis Rossman has? I tend to make more utility type things. I don't really get much chance to make nice things. Your wife freaks out. Japanese are funny with picking up insects. Oh, okay. He's avoiding the geckos. Yeah, I don't imagine they'd be very tasty to geckos. There's you know, some things you can just look at and you go, yeah, I can't imagine you're going to be a... Well, the coloration on that. How is it it changes so much night to night? It's It's got a bit of a bluish tint there, but it's looking clear, so I am happy about that. But it's definitely, I feel like the colors are a wee bit artificial there. Oh, it's had a catastrophic motor failure. Oh, gee, yeah. I guess that's what I do like about the one that I've created is that, you know, I can easily get a replacement motor. Um, and Nick Kennedy. Okay, so, yeah, we've got a 3437 here. I haven't even plugged this in yet. This is one of the collection of 22 boards. You can already see some damage there. That's on temperature sensor. Ah, yeah, here we go. More corrosion. It looks like a pile of puke. Corrosion on the Wi Fi socket, so maybe this has a problem with Wi Fi not working. Although there's corrosion here, I don't think 342 will be affected. Even the SMC is kind of okay. I don't know why I'm doing this when I should actually just plug it in. And it can tell me what's wrong. Oh, and obviously the code is wrong for the job data. Yeah, Miles, it, it does have a setting. It's just sometimes a little tricky to get it to behave. I'm going to leave it as is because it gives... I'm actually finding it really nice because I'm, you can't see it from where I am, but um, over there I've got my 21 inch Mac and it's nice to see what it's looking like for everybody else on a f decent sized screen. Okay, let's plug this in, power's good. Alright. Well, we don't normally see this sort of thing come up. So we have... Yeah, that's interesting. It'll probably try to come back up again. Yep. So what's going on here with the chipmunk? And this is where the chipmunk is different to, say, just using a USB stick or a mouse. It's saying, okay, I've got power on my 5-volt SO rail, but it's not 5 volts. It's saying it's failing the 5-volt test. 
and obviously it does not have any CPU activity. So something is pulling down the 5VSO rail. And this is why the Chipmunk, even though it's a little bit expense to put out, it has its uses for being able to quickly show you some things that are going wrong. Okay, let's pull the volts mode. Like go pairs. So we are getting to SO, but we're not getting our 5 volts. Okay. PP bus is fine. 343 is actually overshot slightly. That's interesting. CPU is not active, which is not surprising. Okay, so not getting 5 volts on SO. See if we're getting five volts out of <sighs> Oh yeah, thirty four thirty seven is the board, sorry. Schmatox Schmatox. Oh, it's been a while since I bothered pulling up a 3437. Fun. I can handle that. Usually because I don't repair them much anymore. Most of them. Um, double click pull. Clicky Beetle nibbled some traces away. It's possible. It's possible. Okay. I'm actually just looking for some LDO lines. No, not that. Okay. Three V three. No, we want five volt here. Okay, so we'll see if we're getting five volts over here. Which is once again on the other side. We'll see if we're getting five volts. And you know, maybe it's degenerating by the time it gets to the SO area. Okay, no, we've only got 4 volts coming out of there. Okay, so we'll disconnect power. Go to the quad display. Weird. What's going on there? Okay, what is this? Oh, that's a microscope. Uh, Splur. Okay, shift this. There's the hot air, and then we've got random cables. That's better. Yeah, the bottom right one, that's the microscope view. Okay. Okay, so we should have a 0.430 diode mode on there. And that's not too, too far off. It's a little bit lower, so... Alright. Kind of weird. Got a couple of choices. It can either be a bad feedback or it can be, you know, there is actually a load that's too high. 
Uh, no, no. We need to have the inductor there, so we can't just pull the inductor out. The fuse... The fuse would be... The trouble is the fuse that there is... Oh, why not? Let's just check it anyway. No, I don't think it's the fuse. The fuse is okay. So it could be a problem with the feedback network or it could be a problem with um, it's not uh, it's been loaded too much but let's have a look at the current drawer on it and see the current drawer should give us an idea and it's barely even it's barely even trying now Pin one to R eighty one sixty five. Eighty one sixty five. Do you spot that? Really? Okay, that's on the all sys power good area. Oh crap! Yeah, there you go. Did you really spot that, Jason? That's um, impressive viewing if you did. Yeah, my camera is severely skew uh, rotated wrong. So please stand by why we apply a certain degree of rotational correction. Okay, much better. Oh, you had exactly the same issue three hours ago. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that's basically, that's our all sys power good chip. I'm kind of curious as to why it's dragging it down to four volts, but we'll certainly fix up that corrosion. And I see there's some corrosion there, which isn't good either. Okay, this is the squeakiest wheel, so we'll go for it first. The chipmunk did the same. It was it nicer? Really? Oh, as in your corrosion was worse, I'm guessing. Is that what you mean? Oh, damn. I don't even let the cats in here and there's cat hair in here. I mean, okay, Milo does come in here occasionally, but that's insufficiently rare to explain the level of cat fur I get in here. I had to run wires. Hey, did I see a creature just turn up? Yep, it is a creature. I recognized your avatar because it's different to... It just seems to... I don't know why, but it pokes out a little bit more than the others. Got to take that off too. Okay. And try not break the chip. That's good.
Oh, I might have got lucky there. Uh, maybe not. That test point looks kind of sus. So Lewis shipped his cats to my place. <laughs> kind of thinking that mine would tell me if that was the case. Well, you never know, maybe it was sneaky. Uh, that test pad actually looks alright. Looks like there is, or was, continuity there. We'll blob it up with some solder though, just to reinforce it. supposed to drag that flux off to there. That uh, creature, I've got one of those. I just don't really care to use it much. I prefer to scratchy scratchy. Because many times the corrosion has gotten in pretty deep here. So you almost inevitably, I should say, you inevitably almost always have to bring out the surgical knife. Alright, so we need another one of those chips. Now I've got to find a board that actually still has one populated. It's a pretty common chip to get stripped off. Do you use the test pads much? I actually do. Particularly now when I'm doing OB when I'm doing open board data capture, I use the test pads a lot. Because they're actually easier to capture the data with. Because yeah, they're designed for probes. And the other nice thing is that when you capture the data from the test points the test pads rather it means then that it's very easy for someone else to also just use the test pads yeah, once you get in the habit of actually looking for where you're going to probe based on the test pads it, um, it does make things a bit quicker rather than trying to delicately balance your tips on the various legs of the part I mean not there isn't always going to be a test pad, but for when there is, I do like to use them. What is that chip? Um, the chip is a uh, three a three BJT combination with a MOSFET. It's a bit of a weird chip. Sorry about the focus, there we go. Basically the three BJTs form a um, ladder and then the MOSFET just performs the final step. Oh wow, that does not feel like it's sitting down. I swear that is not sitting flat. Okay, Copaz, take care. Yeah, it seems to be flat. Oh well. Yeah, Avatar is an OLED display showing real time Fourier transformation running on an 8 bit MCU. Was that, a, was that an uh, AVR? Uh, anyway, looking at that chip, I'll just bring it up on the schematics. So, yeah, this is it here. So what happens is you get in all your power signals, that your power rails that you're wanting to make sure are all available. And then if they are all available, then what will happen is that it should... 
Ah, jeez. Okay, so that, that. Right, it will pull this close, which means this here should then rise up. So all this power good will come up. If any of these are not up to um, the right level, it will cause the difference between the source and the gate you know, to be sufficient that then uh, this starts conducting, which then pulls all this power good down. Man, that almost hurt the brain when it shouldn't have. Okay, so here we go. Still no good. So we do have other issues on board. But certainly that Orsus Power Good was one of them. Time to keep looking. Given that we had that big chunk of corrosion there, it probably stands to reason there's going to be some more somewhere. I mean, there is all this. Uh, that's on a ground floodplain. So unlikely to be our issue. There are things like this, but that's okay. Can't imagine that that line would be the fault. This would rather be another issue down the line, but I don't think this this is not going to be why we're sitting at four volts. Like I said, we're sitting at four volts because either there's a load on the line, or the regulator is getting dud information. So what I might do, the simplest first thing, of course, the dumb choice, is to replace the chip outright. Now there is this damage though. Okay, what are those resistors? Are they part of that feedback? Why is my focus drifting off all the time like a... Okay. part of the 3v3 side. Hmm. Oh well, still needs cleaning up. It's also 3v3. sort of drifting away from the real area of concern here. I mean, this is the section we want to be focused on, the TPS-51-980, because that's what gives us our 3 and 5 volt rails.
what I'll do is I'll... Oh, you can't see. Damn it. Microscope. Hey, sweetie. Oh, okay. I'll be back in a second, folks.
All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. Unfortunately, we uh, <coughs> just had a slight have to check medical event. Things are okay, thankfully, it seems. Look under the skirt of 7501. Well, that is where we are at the moment. <sighs> I mean, there is a bit of junk there. We'll give it a lift. I'm actually first kind of check to see where that divider is that I'm after. Feedback, 75, 20 and 21. Okay, so the dividers, that's them up there. I'm just going to rotate them off and see what their values are, just as a preliminary test. Can you just check with what the chips up to your right of you were working with? What, 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 what? Much confusion from here. The other thing we've got to remember is that Wi-Fi socket has a bunch of junk on it too, so maybe that's actually what the problem is. Oh, you lousy... Oh, the chip I lifted, right. The Ulsys Power Good chip. Okay, I'm just going to test what the resistances of these are. It will be a little bit wonky because they are quite hot right now, but it will give us an idea. Okay, so 37 is actually considerably lower than what we want, which is 41.2. 10k... Oh wow, this is all over the place. I'm just going to try and freshen up my tips. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, that 10k is almost within tolerance, but this one should be 42, 41.2, and it's certainly not. So that's only 35k, and that should be 41.2. Now we can test this theory. Oh man, my nose is really just going crazy by doing the same on this board and seeing what it comes up with. Now I know it's not really a normal thing for resistors to go down in value as they fail, but I have noticed when it comes to resistor dividers for some reason, I do seem to infrequently get that. Like on 3V, on the 3V42 regulator, it is not entirely uncommon for me to encounter a situation where the resistor value drops on one of the dividers. Oh, uh, meter's not on screen. Alright, thanks for that. And I know why too. There we go. Alright, so this is a donor board. Again, it's going to be pretty hot, so it will mangle with the values a little bit. But there you go, see? Smack on. 41k straight away. 
and this one should be 10 yeah very solid 10k reading there we go back to this board that's probably you watch it's going to be 41k now and there you go 35k so that that resistor has reduced in value by a considerable portion from the value it should be and there we go back to 10k it's a bit of a jump around that well, i suspect it's corrosion on there yeah. but anyway that um so yeah that resistor contrary to common perception has gone down in value rather than what most people expect which is for them to go up in value So we're going to get rid of that resistor, replace it with the 41.2 and we'll probably find we get our 5 volts back. That's not really a normal failure mode that people would expect. I should have put leaded solder down. Clearly I like to make like to make my life harder than it needs to be. Yeah, that 10k is looking pretty shonky. I should get rid of that too. Just in case whatever messed with the 41.2 also messed with the 10k even though it was still reading and to be fair it did seem to wiggle around a bit but I usually blame that on corrosion on my you know, junk on the tips of the solder uh, of the meter but thinking back this resistor did not exhibit any of that sort of property you know it pretty much straight away set itself at 10 and stayed at 10. So maybe whatever it was that got on the board in terms of corrosion, perhaps it manipulated the values, but there wasn't really anything around the resistors themselves. It was reading 10 ohms. Really? Damn it, let's see if I can find it. I don't know if this is it or this is the 40k one. It could also be a fault in my software, don't forget. Now you're right, 10 ohms. What the frickity frick? Well, unfortunately, because there's no number stamped on it, there's no way of really knowing. Both resistors were turned. Okay, then there is a fault in the schematic. I think. Or did I... 21. Ah. Uh, no, I actually was reading the wrong one. 10 ohms is the correct value. That's it there the other one of the divider is this one this one here <sighs> easy to make mistakes oh well 
let's see how we go anyway. See if we get our five volts. Yeah, so I just simply picked up the wrong one. Well, it's actually, with the 10 one, at least it didn't make any difference because I was trading chip for chip, uh, resistor for resistor at least. Yep, there we go. It was the divider. It was that 41.2k divider. Now we're good. That is normal for this board. This is a 3437, so it's going to do the um, on-off, on-off, on process. Okay, that wasn't normal though. Let's see if it blinks. Hey, we're alive. So what is this? 1.44. Really? Actually put that effort into it? I think the chip's going to be fine. Because it was only wiggling out slightly. Like that resistor, it, with that having drifted from 41.2 down to 35, it's not damaging this chip, it's just making this chip run it output at 4 volts rather than the 5 volts that we wanted. So I think for the most part this just needs to get itself a nice ultrasonic bath, nice hot 55, 60 centigrade. Mike seems I'm not entirely sure. Like I said, it's not the first time I've encountered that. On the 3V42 circuit, I've certainly had that. I don't know whether it, the resistor gets doped by some contaminant. Like that causes the corrosion elsewhere. Or whether it's a some sort of electrical phenomena that occurs that does it to it. Why aren't you turn? Oh, because you're not turned on. Uh, Phil Pritchard, the reason three times cycles because you have no CMOS batch or RTC for that matter. Uh, no, Dynamo's the 3437 does do that. That is what the 3437 does. No matter what, you know, when it's a fully set up machine, it will still do that. It's just the a quirk of this machine. For some reason, they designed it and it does it that way. And it's the only machine that I know of that does that. Whereas the 165, it boots what you'd consider to be more normal. But yeah, 3437, if it doesn't do that, then you've got problems. <laughs> okay, let's get our test chassis. Almost bent the pins there. No, test a stick. Flat flex. This cable should not actually be above the board and system. It should be tucked underneath. But we're not going to care. Uh, I'm not sure if the screen's behaving or not. Because occasionally, every now and then, it will actually pretend that it's not taking a backlight. Let's 
spin stop spinning stop now yeah, it should come up proper and bong there's the bong yep and we do have in fact a full display so there you go that is um that is not a standard sort of signature failure of sorts and if you always if you're under the impression that resistors always fail by going higher resistance then that would probably not be something that you'd expect although at some point you might go visiting the voltage divider the feedback I should rather say which is the voltage divider back to the chip and you would try and yeah, you'd investigate that at some point. The question is whether you do it before you lose your sanity or not. Yep, it's behaving quite well, pretty much at full speed. And there we go, 4 gig, 1.4 serial numbers intact excellent shut down another one fixed yes the well it's over here with the um, all sys power good chip hey for chumba velvi yeah, the fan's not happy rattling around because it's it's not even secured. It was just free floating there. Ah, what are you doing, bug? Crazy bugs. If I send you a seventeen oh six, only taking five volt, not twenty. Can you do a quick turnaround? Yeah. You had no parts for a 1706. I would have thought you would have heaps of those. Yes, send it and I will do it on the day I receive it. How's that sound? But, um, so what, you think it's CD3215 related, hopefully? And if I can't do it in the day, then I'll send it back. As in, if I can't solve it in one day, I'll send it back to you. Because I do have all the parts here for them. Oh, you've used all your parts. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. I was sitting here thinking... Yeah, I was basically thinking that no, you don't have the parts. It was very confusing to me. Because I know that you basically cover everything. Now, we do need to clean up this Wi-Fi connector a bit. Yeah, it's got a bit of junk in there. So we're just going to flux and boil it to try and consume some of that corrosion before it goes into the ultrasonic. Oh, you had me worried there for a second, Jason. Uh, the power to the PB uh, to the Wi-Fi that is actually controlled by a switch, a little chip switch. It's like one of these little blue glass-looking ones. One of these two, I think. Uh, that third pin on the right, that's looking pretty gnarly. Internally, they look all right. 
the back's a little bit gnarly, but not too bad. That's just the shield. But that third pin there, I might just try and scratch it back a little bit. It's not worth taking the connector off. Let's just see what that pin's even for. USB Bluetooth connection, and it's one of the data ones, so yeah, we should be able to get away with that. Yeah, it's not too bad. The ultrasonic will clean that up enough. It hasn't chewed completely through the pin. I should have known they were USB data pair, because see this trace design here that's how you generally know you're dealing with a data pair a, a um, matched pair or uh, shape why can't I remember the proper name for a differential pair that's it Whew. worried then for a second I was going to have to hand in my electronics geek card but yeah so that's a differential data pair That should be just fine. Okay, another one for the the wash. All oh right, this board. <laughs> I was about to throw that in the junk pile. It may yet get there. Okay, so this is the next one. This is a 3437. This is an Apple refurb board. You can tell it's got this dreaded white sticker on it. And it's about the lowest of the low boards that you can get. It's a 1.3 gigahertz, four gigabyte RAM. So low, so low. To be fair, I probably could sell these on eBay. I'm just not game to. The main reason being is I'm worried that people will try to buy them and then scam me. Yeah, they'll be like, oh, it doesn't work. And I'll be like, oh, whatever. And, you know, I'll have to be all compromising and giving them money back and probably fly a supermodel down to them to have dinner with them or something just to keep, them, keep my rating. Uh, 600... Okay, 34.37 again, so we are going to have this behavior. This looks like it might be running. Or maybe not. Yep, there it goes. Okay, so we may have some sort of peripheral failure. As in, it's not charging, or it has no backlight, or something like that. Yeah, the joy of the FRUs. I have a 3437 that will not detect a solid state drive no matter what I do. It could be just the CPU or the PCH has been damaged. It's like those ones where... Uh, what was it, the 239 board, I think it was? Where it will boot and run, but you can never get display out on them again unless you use USB-C for the display. So, I know there have been a few instances where yeah, you just can't get the disk access and it ends up being a problem with the PCH or the CPU. And it's just one of those Dave Jones wah, wah, wah moments, unfortunately. 50 bucks on no backlight. Mm. Okay, we're on the gambling streaks tonight. Let's see how we go. So that display is energized, I think. C 
send Mrs. I don't even know who Miss Australia is anymore. Well, we've got a bonger. Oh, I would say the big problem this one's got is the fact that it's running Big Sur. <laughs> uh, Alright, that runs. Looks like Mal's just lost 50 bucks. Okay, what else could it be? SD card not reading. It could be the um, boot, the SSD not reading on this one. It's booting very slow, so I am actually thinking it might be battery related. Because that, the progression bar, it's moving a little bit too. Oh, here we go. Just, I oh know it's showing the battery. It's not that. The charge rate's at 2 amps, so it's not that. I really am not a big fan of the um, display style, the icon styles in Big Sur. I know, I prefer the older style. Big Sur makes me think of the 1920s. Dallas Mac. Alright. See if it reads the SD card. Can't imagine they'd replace the entire main board for something like that. No, nope, that's fine. Uh, all right, shut it down. I'll get a Mac drive stick. Maybe Thunderbolt's failing, that's quite possible. Uh, let's see, let's try High Sierra. Oh, god damn it, I left the. Oh well. I was gonna say, I left the. I'll disconnect the battery, but I left the mag safe in. Super smart. I'll put a Wi Fi in there as well just to make sure that's being picked up. Yes, I did that since you all complained more than what I was willing to tolerate. I've decided to go for low latency. So I expect you to be all be thankful. Okay. I don't know if it's going to boot because I don't know what is actually on that solid state drive. Damros, what are you thanking me for? Highly unusual for me to care. Oh, that's so insulting. I care a lot. I just choose not to respond. <laughs> well, it's booting off that uh, solid state drive. And it's definitely one of mine. You said to be think oh right, fair enough, fair enough. 
Let's see if it shows Wi-Fi. Well, it certainly detects the Wi-Fi. And yeah, Wi-Fi is working. Okay, let's see if the FaceTime works. Yeah. Yep, FaceTime works. Now, I... I don't know why this has been replaced in that case. The only possible thing I can think of is the person opted to have an upgrade. Given how, you know, incredibly weak this particular board is. Video out, oh right, you mean in terms of... Thunderbolt. Who would you, who would even use Thunderbolt on this? Anyway, I'll go get the Thunderbolt to HDMI cable. Actually, I've got a couple of those. Maybe one down here, rather than me having to go into the other room. Is there any way you can upgrade the RAM? Ah, uh, you can. It's it's a schlep though. But yeah, you can. Ah, yeah, good. Found it. So this is my Belkin one. This is my all types one. But generally, I use this one most. Using the screen. It's the screen that Jim Hooks sent quite a while ago now. Well, it did activate, so I suspect we're going to see a screen soon. Yep, that works fine. So it's not that. No, I don't know what it is. I don't know what this board would have gone in for, or rather been removed for. I think the problem is that a lot of the time it's a bit harder to find the 8 gig machines for you to be able to take the RAM from them. I mean, I might have one or two. Mind you, they would be 165 machines. I'm not, I'd imagine the RAMs are the same. You would just have to change the strapping. I don't know what Thunderbolt mode that was running in. All I know is I plug the screen in and it works. You can't just buy the RAM chips. Uh, you probably can from AliExpress. It's just not something I would ever really do because the amount of work that's involved. Okay, look, it's not too bad on these boards because you basically just got the four chips and then you change the strapping resistors to you know pick which type, of, what brand of chip you have and everything like that. Although I certainly wouldn't do it on this one because you know it is only a very low performance board. If it was like a 1.6 or similar mega uh, gigahertz then I would consider it. But for all we know it's um, working. I was told by the group that I picked this up from or this whole collection of boards from they said there may be one or two boards in here that actually are fully functional. So it makes me wonder whether they did in fact have customers say, look, you know, I just want to go up to a high spec board. Mm, 
notice that many of the 3437 boards have microfarad value. That will be the DC inboard at fault. Most times it's the DC inboard at fault. Specifically, it will be these two chips here, uh, these two caps here usually. Most of the time, yeah, there's a rubber boot covering this. And the problem is there's this hole on the back of the socket for the headphones and um, it gets into here and messes things up so have a look at that that might be it otherwise it could actually just be the microphone flex on the chassis itself that's no good now look at that that's damaged that there's partially sheared off good thing it's probably just a protection diode Okay, I've written on there, works, didn't fix. So if I ever get to the point where I need to use this board, which to be honest, I don't think I ever will, um, hopefully I'll be reminded why I wrote that. Alright, uh, let's see. I've got a 3115 that's likely not worth the time of day. What have I got? These are fifteen oh two type boards. Let's see which one. Now the trouble with the fifteen oh twos. Okay, so you got the forty nine twenty fours, which are the twenty fifteen model. And you're going to have a different screen for those compared to the other ones. The three, yeah, so like the 3536, you've got to have a different screen to test them compared to the 4924. It makes it a tad bit frustrating, to be honest. It is what is uh, so nice about the 1466s is that your 3437 and your 165 just works in the same chassis regardless. Okay, so we're going to tackle the 3536. What is your spec? You're a 2.44. Why? You're junk. Okay, what about you? 2.78. Ooh, yeah, okay. This one's... That one sounds juicier. That does mean I have to go find my 2015 screen. This is a 2.78 as well. Okay. What the hell? It's a bend in the board. Big bouncy bend. Oh, well, I think we found the problem straight away on that. Yuck. Uh, that's really had a bad day. And like I said, it's bent. The whole board has a bend in it. Okay, bad choice. I have a couple of 40 and 25 machines. Oh dear God, no, toss them. Toss them. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't say like that. Even if you get the 40 and 25s going, then you have the problem of the SMCs are always getting destroyed in them on the battery charger I2C line. And then you can't even get the batteries for them, or at least not too easily. Uh, no, just not feeling you, Mr. 1502s. I think I might play with my friend's 1398 instead. 1398 might be 3662. 3662. 
triple three two. Let's play with you. Because you are probably going to be a shoe rubber fault. Hey, is Graham in here, is he? Oh, there he is. Ah, oh, he's complaining four gigs. Gee whiz. I saw someone making that comment and I thought, oh, someone who knows that four gigs is terrible. And I did not read the name. Right, so this is a 2.48. I'm going to guess this is a shoe rubber fault. Let me go. Look at the corrosion there, though. That's Townsville living for you. The liquid damage marker, of course, says, I'm fine, dude. Bane of the Midnight Oil. Hey, Wayne Taylor. Good to see you. Yeah, same, rather. Okay. Alright, so this is what we call the shoe rubber model, or, <laughs> okay, we don't really call it that. But the primary fault on the A20332 is that it has a problem with the screen blanking out and crashing and stuff like that. And it comes down to this chip here. Uh, this is the VREG controller for the GPU. And they, for some reason, they have a problem with the joins on this chip. And so what Apple did as a fix is they put a piece of rubber on the top so that it would push down harder on the chip to make sure that the pins stay connected longer. Well, it's not really a proper fix. So we'll do the proper fix and see if the board is okay. Yeah, focus much. Ah, we're talking about the aircon system, the cooling system. Thomas, if you're running something like High Sierra or whatever, you're probably going to be fine with 4 gigs. And in fact, you know, most people, if you're just running the browser, you're probably going to be fine. But 8 gigs definitely gives you that extra room. Now this is a chip where I usually end up using assistive heat after I've put down the solder. Because I don't have three hands, the first thing I do is I just like, get things ready, melt the flux down a bit, and use my diminutive little micro pencil which does not have the thermal capacity to really do this job right. So we, we try our best, and you've got to make sure you don't gobble up that little resistor there. Very easy to gobble that resistor up. Okay, and you can see the solder starts to bridge quite badly over there. That's not a problem. We're just basically just getting some solder down on those pins, some nice leaded solder. Because we all need some neurological damage. Otherwise, how will we get away with doing terrible things, nutty things as we get older? Alright, so there's enough down there now. And I bring in the assistant heat, which is my hot air station set at 250 centigrade. And basically the purpose of the assistive heat is that it warms up the board overall and stops the board from gobbling up all the heat out of the small tip that I have. Man, that sounds wrong. And it allows me to flow those connections properly. See how they don't stick anymore? They don't bridge, they don't stick. And that's because this here it just, it's like a turbo boost for the little tiny soldering tip. And we're good. Yeah, the Queensland, New South Wales flooding is quite bad. It's quite a distance from me, about 1500 kilometers plus, but yeah, it is quite significant. Okay, so that's that fixed. 
And I'm just gonna check. To see, oh, sweet mercy! All right, so the V rig chips, the uh, V RAM chips are gonna be pretty upset here. They probably have corrosion under them. So we'll knock off some of this protective silicon stuff, which basically didn't do its job. Let me just get my Grim Reaper out. Um, at the Graham, I mean, there's no reason it can't work for anything. Basically, it's when you need to work on something that's small, like you've got to get between a gap or something like that, but you need a lot more heat than what that tip can actually provide, then yeah, it works. Or anything, say if you've got, like when you were doing those capacitors on the mainboard, when you're doing the mainboard cat replacement, you could use assistive heat to let that solder wick through a lot easier. It's basically just like having the power of a big tip without having a big tip. I'm waiting for YouTube to demonetize the hell out of me soon. Suggestive... Suggestive speech. Anyway, I'm just trying to get rid of this... silicon -y stuff. Edge bonding. It's not the same as underfill. This stuff you can actually manipulate fairly well. Underfill, on the other hand, is rather reluctant to let you do anything with it. Okay, that's good. I just need to have a clear access. Oh, frick me. Bug just flew straight in my eyeball. Damn, living in the tropics. Okay, we're gonna get some flux under there. I'm just gonna go to 360 on this. my repair well I was triggering people at the start of the video with my wooden plank computer build that's all over and done with now I'm triggering professionals with my unprofessional MacBook repairs mostly what I'm doing here is just going through the stack of MacBook boards that I've got seeing which ones are going to be donors and which ones are going to be well, to be honest, I don't know what I'm going to do with the ones that I fix. Because they are piling up with all the rest of the ones that I have done before. But it is getting to the point now where I'm even using good boards as donors. Particularly if they are low spec boards. Oh, no. This is a train wreck. What have I chosen? Okay. Uh, what a train wreck. Look at this. Okay, so this is the audio section. If we're lucky, this is all going to be just surface crap. I'm going to use some 80-20 and a toothbrush for this. Yeah, let us hope there's no nuclear activity going on, in all seriousness. Yeah, once that threshold's reached, then it's, yeah, I can't imagine good things. It's the first time in a while that I've been a little bit worried about the global stability in this respect. That the last time was at you know, towards the end of the Cold War period, or during the Cold War period. That was pretty pretty scary as a kid. 
Uh, Thomas, you're talking about the Grim Reaper, this one. This is just a... Um, you can get them from pretty much any electronics place like Union Repair or whatever. They're just replaceable little tips and blades. It's not actually sharp, it's not like a knife or anything, it's just a pick. I forget what they properly call them. Can you build them up to sell on? Well, I'm just a little concerned about the whole sell process because my only real option is eBay and I know that's... Yeah, I'm just going to get done over a barrel with eBay. It's inevitable. Yeah, toothbrush and alcohol does a good job. And then you got to clean it up, the soldering joints. Some pretty damn gnarly ones down there. The main thing you want to check is that... <clears throat> I'm losing my voice at the moment. Um, the main thing you want to check is that none of those test points have corroded through. That's the more common sort of failure point. So using the micro pencil iron, or in fact any iron, is a good test for a lot of these components, the two-sided components, like resistors and capacitors. Because if you scrub on one side, if the other side has a bad corrosion underneath the pad, it's been undercut or anything like that, then it will typically detach itself when you do the scrubbing. So it's a good test if you're not sure if there are any duds in there. Obviously that technique doesn't really apply to devices with more than two pads. It's a bit of a tricky situation because I can't really get as fine as this knife blade is can't really get in there so I'm gonna have to just hope that the connections are mostly good this connection in the middle here it does look like it might be a problem let's see if we can get it to come to life okay it's taking solder scritchy scratch scritchy scratch yeah looks like that one turned out alright after all well that's a good example of how an area that looks really ratty and overwhelming can in fact be just a case of needing a clean. What tip do you prefer for the micro pencil? Um, the what is it? That's just the KN tip. Yeah, the knife tip. So, that's it there. That's a, what, $70, $80 tip? Oh, there it is. T30KN. Haha. <laughs> Upside down because it's Australia. But uh, that's the preferred tip. And ever since getting that and moving over to it, my poor little JSO2 basically never gets any love anymore. Prior to getting the micro pencil, the JSO2 was the tip that we always used. Now I wonder how on earth I managed to do that. Well, someone's knocked a part off there. Oh, that's a solid job, too. Crikey. So, what's the end result of the new 4K camera? Okay, you are looking at it right now, obviously. And. I went over the top and got myself an 8K cable for it, which resolved the glitching. And also concurrently, the Linux drivers and OBS have all caught up with everything. So now I can access the camera directly through OBS without having to use the Video for Linux 2 driver wrapper. 
And so yeah, we've got the result we have. I did try the splitter and the splitter did set the resolution and refresh rate correctly, but I couldn't get, oh damn it, I was only at 360. I couldn't get the color mode to be right, so I left it for now. And I'm pretty happy with how things are now. Micro major repair, you got the JVC, do you? Alright, now I'm trying to work out. I'm going to guess by the fact that I can see a veer stalk just here. See how you can see that little bit of a circular discoloration between the chip and the pad? That tells me that under here there is not going to be... It's okay that this end lifted up. I can just push it back down, put the cap on there and it's fine because the trace goes off underneath the top layer wherever it's going to go. So we can actually put that cap right back where it was. And you probably would not have seen that. A little bit of discoloration that lets me know. I do need to get more light but that seems to be a perpetual thing What temp do you normally set when you're removing components with unleaded solder? Usually 470. Yeah, 470 and about 90% here. Depends on the board. You wouldn't do that on an iPhone board. But on a MacBook board, the level of um, ground planing that these boards have is truly impressive and they will suck every bit of heat they can away from the part you're trying to get removed. So yeah, you do need some solid power coming out of your hot air station. Hey Graham, if you're there, do you want me to try and blow up a, a, a heat pipe? We can sit there and see what happens to our heat pipe if I put the hot air on it for a a minute or two. That was just the bottom side of the board. Senseless destruction. Oh, it was more just to prove a point about something. Oof. It's a bit more corrosion there. They'll play havoc on something. Let's see. Uh, should be good. Okay, a bit of corrosion damage on that connector there. What are you? I think you are just a JTAG, I think. Not a true JTAG, but effectively a JTAG. Oh, oh, ah, damn it, Graham's probably already gone away. God damn it. Graham, raise your hand if you're here, please. And he's not. Oh well. Bugger. Uh, what was I going to do? Oh, I was just checking what that connector's for. J5100. LPC, SPI, con. Uh, yeah, I don't think you're anything. God damn it. I was going to show him something on flex board view because I noticed he was not getting it. 
let's see. We're going to have a look at this ring light that... And my chat window just disappeared, I think, because of... Sorry, I'm not used to using these fancy desktop managers anymore. Oh, you did send me to a YouTube. Oh, well. Anyway. No problem. I'm going to go get my 3332 chassis and see what we can do about this. Probably gone to deal with customers. What are they? Triple three two, where are you? Under the stack of crap. Oh, fifteen thirty four. Why, oh, why do I have that? Probably use it as a doorstop. Really, fifteen thirty fours. If anyone brings you a fifteen thirty four, unless it's for data recovery, just you know, um, pretend you're not there. No good comes from 1534. Okay, I think you are a triple three two. Oh, gross. That is truly gross. Oh, yeah, okay, he is here. good -o. Um Graham, look, I don't know if you do know, but whatever, in the video. But with the flex board view, I just want to be sure that you knew what I'm about to do. If, say, you're looking for a part, you want to find out where this part is in the schematic, you can either click on it and click up here for the search where it says PDF, and it'll go there. Or you can just right click on the part and go up to the search here. And obviously it's going to find the same thing like this. And then if you want to do the same, like say you're wanting to finding out where this part here is, you just right click on that number and it brings it up in Flexboard view. So basically right click on anything and it will take you to the respective thing on the other version of the display that that so that's how it works nice and easy because I only bring that up because I could have sworn I saw you typing in what you're searching for and I mean yeah you can do that like up here if you want to actually find out where something is like ah oh, 0911 and then you can go search anyway just thought I'd bring that up, and apologies if I'm telling you what you already know. I just didn't want you to miss out on that, because that really is the main thing that uh, made Flexboard View useful. Oh, there's also, there's also, I mean, I'm scratching my nose on there. You can also just press F1 for help, I think, in that one. Oh yeah, in the PDF viewer you got F1. And it gives you a quick, quick guides. In Flexboard view, it's in your program preferences, preferences, and you can change all your keys. The keys will also apply to the schematic viewer as well. Anyway, enough of wasting your time. Let's get to uh, sorting this out. Yeah, old open board view habits do die hard, but then once you do get used to it, it's probably going to be near impossible for you to go back. And that is why people harass me. Oh, I shouldn't say harass me. 
that's why people do ask me a lot to give them free copies but I'm like if you want the feature you can pay for it I get no shortage of people saying oh I'm in a poor country and I don't earn a lot of money that's like a month's worth of wages and I respect that but at the same time it's like well there is open board view and that does work perfectly well and as professionals we use that for a very long time perfectly adequately and so you should be able to use it yourself to the point where you'll get enough money to be able to buy flexboard view if it matters to you anyway that's that's just me being my a-hole salesman usually I respond with the emails when they ask this sort of thing I say good news there's actually a free version of Flexboard View available known as Open Board View, which will allow you to do most of what you need, or everything that you need, and you don't have to pay a thing. But of course, I know full well that they're already using Open Board View, but I just try to hammer it home that they should be thankful for what they've got. Ah. Uh. Okay, so I can't get rid of that. That is just the JTAG. My God, my nose is so... It's like I've got fluff stuck on the edge of it or something. Oh, it is driving me mad. Yeah, Mike, um, it's kind of stalled a bit because I've just been tied up with so many things. But we do have about 10,000 entries at this point. Let's have a look. Open... Um, actually, no, I'm wrong. It's about 20,000 entries. Oh, more than 20 now. Okay. If we go to schematics. Yeah, so we've got over 20,000 data entries. And these are all the boards we've got at the moment listed. So it's, it is, you know, it's doing well. Even without me doing a lot of activity with it. And certainly things like the 165 board, they are absolutely just jam-packed with information. So if you have a look at the board, where are all the green dots are, that's where people have taken you know, a data sample. So the 165 is perhaps one of the most densely populated data boards. You don't have to have that on, that's just for... And so yeah, it gives you all the readings that you need, all very handy. So yeah, people have been doing stuff, so that's great. Yeah, 20,000 entries, so 20,000 individual data points. Each board probably has about 1,000 per board, typically. So you can tell from that that not all the boards are done completely. And yeah, that's understandable because it's a lot of hard work and it's boring as hell. And it doesn't help that I haven't shipped out all the kits. So people are actually adding data even without the easy capture kits. And that's really bad at me. I wish I had a good... Was that a bong? That sounded kind of weird. Hey, well, we've got display. Uh, Travis, if you find non-Mac boards, that's perfectly good too. I think that's the next sort of stage on what I have to do with... Um, what do you call it? with flexboard view and open board data is to try and get the message out there that it although it started out with us mostly doing it for macbook boards it actually works for all boards that have board views are these samples in the schematic board view files or does flexboard view itself download them it's downloaded from the open board data um, page itself so if i go to schematics again so when you've loaded up a board you can go into the preferences and you can search the server for the board you're looking for so in this case you know 165 you can do a search and then it will come back and say okay i've made these matches and you pick which one you want i should actually make it that if it only finds one match it just downloads that anyway 
So you select it and then you download the data. And it looks like someone's actually added another note to the diagnostic sequence. So if we go look at... Oh yeah, there's seven notes now. Oh, cancel that. What has someone added? Oh, it looks like someone's added a G3 to S3 sequence guide. Okay, so basically what you can do is you can follow the so like you know you click on that and it says check that for three volts and then you can you know go on to the next one and the next one next one next one and just keep going through the list until you find what you you know whether it's faulty or not okay that's the end of that there yeah. so yeah people can basically produce their own guides on how to diagnose things and uh, we, the common one I use is the guide for detecting whether you've got PM sleep S4L or not. Anyway, enough about that. Looks like we're booted. Oh, don't worry about that, Graham. You're a busy man. Most of the time I find it takes, you know, seven or eight exposures before people finally click in on things. Wish consoles had board views. Well, Micromage, you know, there are a couple of people working on that, I think. The first thing you need, of course, is someone to draw up the board and then create the schematic and then you can export them as a board view and schematic. And that's it. So if you do it in KiCad or you know, Eagle or anything like that, then that would do the trick. I don't think the clicky clicks working on this. Yeah, we do not have trackpad. Or well, maybe we do. It's just a bit dodgy in that corner. Yeah, I think okay. The trackpad's a little bit dodgy, which means probably the battery pack has to be yanked, and yeah, that's okay. The camera doesn't seem to be active. That's because it's not plugged in. Yep, okay. Oh well, the board itself, it's working. I think the chassis is just a bit, a bit rotten. So about this Mac. Two point four gigahertz i seven eight gigs of RAM. Early twenty thirteen. It's a nice machine. It's a nice machine still. Shut down. Shut down. So that board's working. Are there language packs? No. At the moment, Flexboard View is strictly English. Maybe one day I'll get around to doing that, but for now, no. It's, it's just English. I'm sorry. But I do use UK English rather than American English. Does it tie values to pad references or net name? It ties them to the net name. But each net will have a unique name regardless. So even if it's not something that's meaningful to you, it should still have a net name. Why not a Swedish version? Maybe probably because I'm not Swedish. Doing international language versions of software, it's basically, it's a whole nother process and fun and games. And then it's bad enough doing it for one operating system, let alone three operating systems. So it's a case of you really you get your software to the point where you consider it to be quite stable and you don't look like you're going to be doing anything dramatic for the next two years. 
And at that point, you decide to invest a whole lot of time and money into making international language packs because, you know, it's um, it's not going to be a high return on investment on that. TBA view is, I do have the information I need. Time is my biggest problem right now. I simply just don't have it. I create silly graphics and fix switches for micromanage, no CAD. Oh, well, you know, I mean, you can learn to use KiCad or um, Eagle. It's not that bad. It's pretty easy. Thank you, Greg. FlexB, V, and Klingon. Ugh, that's so nerdy. I wouldn't do that. And then someone will go, oh, yeah, he's not a nerd. He'd do it in, um, I don't know, Wookiee Wookie language. I was like, I'm not a Star Wars nerd either. I'm a nothing nerd. I don't really follow any of that stuff. I'll watch shows, but um, I'm not really a, a f yeah, I'm not really a strong follower. For me, good shows for me are like Scrubs or Justified or, uh, damn, can't, now I can't think of series that I like. I like so many series. Could charge them for it. Yeah, I don't think that would go down so well. Oh, well. All right, well, listen, it's getting late. It is 2.30 in the morning. We've done three, four boards, and we tortured people with the um, computer build. So I'm going to do that computer build, finish it up, and present it to you all. And... Uh, you can all critique it and I will duly ignore your critique because it'll already be done. Can you do pig Latin language for Flexboard? You know, I could do um, pigeon. Pigeon like as in Papua New Guinea pigeon. That'd be cool. If I was doing another language, probably the first one I'd be doing is Afrikaans. Simply or Dutch or something Dutch based. That should get to most people. Alright, I'm out of here. Yep. Um, yeah, 2.30 in the morning. It's getting tiresome on me and I'm starting to say things I probably shouldn't say. Try harder. You know, uh, Graham, that's going to become a thing, isn't it? Yeah, try harder. You're better than this. I will do that. Next video, we're going to try harder and we're going to be better. Until then, take care. I'll see you later.